Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Ken. Hey, turn this down. Too much audio. Well, we made it. Believe it or not, we're late, but we made it. And uh, so welcome, everyone, to episode 521 of Line Upon Line, live from Cookville, Tennessee. So uh, tonight's uh, episode is, uh, remind me what tonight is. <laughs> Uh, it's about the benefits of the holy days. All right. The benefits of the holy days. And uh, Dr. Ricks, if you'd start us out, that would be great. Alvius focuses on spring holy days. And just want to uh, compliment Jerry Lindner and the people of Cookville. Those who are out there, you may want to come next year. It's a great mm -hmm. way to get in the mood for the season. Um, <clears throat> okay. My first groaner would be, um, the man says, I don't always go the extra mile, except when I miss my exit. <laughs> um, now, this uh, joke is dedicated by Mary Ann for Ann Lewis. And the joke goes like this. The woman sees a roach in the kitchen. She's, she's somewhat freaked out. And her husband scrubs the kitchen. He scrubs the cabinet. He gets down and scrubs on the floor. To you know, handle this great problem. His wife's impressed. She says to herself, and tomorrow you put one in the room. <laughs> this is called the lecture. A guy is driving a little weedly wheel late at night, 2 30 a.m. The uh, state police stop him and they say, uh, you're a distinguished citizen. What are you doing out this late at night? What's going on? He, uh, well, um, I'm going to a lecture. A lecture on a lecture on smoking, alcoholism, and the dangers of staying out too late. He's well, stay true. So who's giving you this lecture? My wife. That's <laughs> <laughs> a lecture he's on his way to. Okay. Um, a man goes to a computer dating store looking to get matched up. And the, he gives the information to the man who types it in the computer. He says, I'm looking for someone who loves the outdoor, really loves fishing, loves swimming, loves formal attire, and is small. The computer comes back with, big one. Okay. Um, we're going to focus on the benefits of the Holy Days, the annual Sabbaths, but our focus will be on the spring ones because that's the season we're going into. But the principle applies to all of them. And the principle, we believe that everything God does is for our benefit. Not his benefit, but for our benefit. Can we read our first scripture, Ken, and we can talk about it? Well, we might. I don't think I have the mic set up for that yet, but... I'll just read it. I, I'll next time I'll put it up the slide. So Mark uh, two twenty four, and the Pharisees said, "But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in the need and hungry? He said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath.'" So can you take that principle and extrapolate for for all the holy days? I mean, the Sabbath I realize is a weekly one, but the annuals, the same principle should apply, right? Mm -hmm. They're made for our benefits. Uh, what do you think, Chris? Yeah. I mean, you get rest. You get spiritual rejuvenation. You know, it's, a, it's always very beneficial every holy day, whether it's unleavened bread or the weekly Sabbath. Yeah, and it's good. And I believe the Passover and unleavened bread really benefit us mm -hmm. if you think about it. Um, would you read John 14, 16, and 18? Okay. I'm going to give it a shot here. Uh, that ain't it. PowerPoint. That still ain't it. All right. Um, and I will pray for the, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the word world cannot receive uh, him for he dwells with you and will be in you I will not leave you orphans I will come to you and I would argue that you can deeply keep the Passover 
you will automatically be closer to Christ and the Father. Mm-hmm. And that'll benefit you. What do you think, Ken? Uh, I'm, I didn't hear him. Working on getting this great so oh, that's right. <laughs> getting it's here. But that Passover does the more you get into it, the closer you get to Christ. It's kind of hard to isn't that really so obvious? I got a live audience in front of me at Cookville. But isn't that so obvious when you think about it, right? Yes. Passover is meant to bring us and Christ closer together. Um, and Jesus is the true bread from heaven. He's the Passover lamb. I mean, um, and the Bible is pretty methodical on the whole thing. John one twenty nine reads, and I know Ken is trying to get this system to put it up, and it um, we can see it on his one of his monitors, but it doesn't seem to come up to the audience, right? Just yet. Yeah, not quite yet. I'll go ahead and just read it while Ken works on it. This is John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Didn't that one verse pretty much encapsulate one of the greatest spiritual experiences? Mm-hmm. And it's tied to the holy days of unleavened bread, which we'll get into as time goes on, but I remember when I first started coming to church and started understanding things, I realized all the days I was in the Baptist church, I never saw that Christ was the Lamb of God. Did anybody ever see that mention, Chris, to you? No, it, it, it didn't. When you partake of the Lord's Supper in those days, I had a similar background. You just did it quarterly, and it didn't have the meaning that it has when you observe it on the 14th, you know, as the Bible instructs us to do, it brings it so much deeper to who Jesus Christ really is. It really does. I mean, it's the, it's the, Christ is the bread of life. And, um, and I'm just going to read John three seventeen. just kind of follow suit. It goes, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why Christ came. Something we said last week. Remember we said that God is not going to fail. Satan is throwing all kinds of tricks at us. And he's saying that's good at what he does. You know, admit that he's smart. But in spite of all he does, God will eventually, Christ will be the bread of life for the vast majority of mankind. I really believe that. And uh, we got it on the screen now. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, uh, Thank you, Ken. By the way, this is, especially when you're portable equipment, this is a lot harder than it looks, right? A little bit. (laughs) Looks pretty hard to me, but that's just me. (laughs) It looks even harder for me. Oh, should I say that? Anyway, some of us were born in the tech world, and other of us were born long before the tech world, so we're not quite so techy. Um, and I think one of the things that we we want to have people think about, um, and I just want to get to it real quickly, but I'll be sure I'm not leaving anything out. John 650, you've got it on the screen, right? Yes, I do. Um, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may... No, oh, and it's not going out, is it? Yeah, it is. I see there it. we go. Uh, well, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the flesh of the world. When the, by the way, when he said that to the Jews, a lot of the Jewish leaders thought, this is terrible. They didn't understand it. And the world still doesn't understand it. But really, in a metaphorical sense, when you eat that bread, we're getting Christ inside us, in our hearts. And uh, it's something that, I guess what we want to do is try to appreciate it. 
What do you think, Chris? Yeah, if people would study, ask God to show them the relevance of it. It's, it's amazing when your eyes are open to these days, when you understand that Jesus Christ is actually the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of all, you know, all mankind. So there is no covering anymore. He's able to actually do the job. And it becomes so much more plain when you look at the days of unleavened bread and the annual Passover. And you think about unleavened bread, that's really the body of Christ, isn't it? The Lamb of God. I mean, it's it's really clear, but I never saw it many years ago. No. Those things you just are there, but you don't really notice it until God calls you. Uh, and for those who wish to say, well, this is only for Jewish Christians or the Messianic Christians, the next scripture we're going to read, 1 Corinthians 5, knocks that idea. In a hand. It just doesn't. There's no way you can read this scripture and not see it. Go ahead and read it for us, Ken. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. Since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. When Paul said to the Gentile Corinthians, keep the feast, he meant Easter. He meant Easter, eh, honey, right? <laughs> well, there, there are a few articles you read. Well, he only meant that figuratively. I see when you read a, even the better translation, when it says, as you really are unleavened, he wrote the letter knowing it would get there during days of unleavened bread. He knew they would be unleavened. How do you know that? Because he taught them that. And so if Gentiles are unleavened, and he told them to keep the feast, I mean, how can you get around it? The guy that wrote the New Testament said, keep the feast of unleavened bread. And any translation you look it up in just makes it even that much more plainer. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he's talking about. When I got into the church, I had known since a young, since I was young, that Christmas was pagan, Easter was pagan because my dad listened to Garner Ted. He never joined a church and didn't keep any of those holy days, or he ate, and he ate pork. He just liked the way he talked and he believed some of his stuff, but. The reason I got into the church is because I was driving. I remember the day. It was like, you know, people remember when Kennedy was shot. I remember when the uh, space shuttle blew up. I remember when 9-11. And I remember the day when I decided to get in the church. I'm driving on the road, and I said, I know what not to do. Don't do Easter. Don't do Christmas. Things like that. I didn't know about pork and that. But I said, I need to find out what I should do. Because I know what I'm not to do. There's got to be something I should do. And yeah. I've called, I called Tyler, and it was 2004 spring, about this time of year. I called Tyler, and I've been going to church ever since. I talked to um, Marvin Kobasar. I don't know if anybody remembers Marvin Kobasar, nicest guy you'll ever meet, mm -hmm. unless you golf with him. But he, uh, unfortunately, is no longer with us, nor his wife, Barb. But uh, they were great. They, offered, they welcomed us in. And I've been going ever since. It was beautiful. But I learned one of the first things I studied was what should I be doing? And somebody in our church said, maybe it was Henry. Anyway, he said that um, there's a reason why we're eating the bread seven days. It's not that you're not eating leavened bread, but you should also, on the positive side, eat unleavened bread. And you know what? I, I like bread. I found that unleavened bread is pasty. And, but guess what? When you're denied other bread, you can find a way to make it taste good. What do you think? It's amazing what a little butter and honey will do, isn't it? Yep. No. You know, Dolores <laughs> says there's a, there'll be a day coming up soon where there'll be baking day where she bakes all the unleavened stuff for unleavened bread. I, I vacate the kitchen. I'll be in the barn or something while she's doing. I mean, I vacate the living room. I just get out of the way. I don't want to be in it. And she does that all day. And uh, I know it's easy to say this coming from me, but you take the leavening out, you can actually gain weight in unleavened bread because of all the good stuff that takes the place of what would be the symbolic sin that we 
uh, take out of our lives during that period of time. So actually, by taking the sin out, what replaces it can actually be better for you. Yeah, yeah good nourishment. That's a good, that's a good example of that. You might try cream cheese and peanut butter and maybe a little bit of salt and pepper on the cream cheese, if you like a little spice. And all of a sudden, that pasty bread isn't so bad. Those are the only thing you got. <laughs> And I started looking forward to it. Let me get some cream. She makes cream some without leavening. Wow. Okay, all kinds of good stuff without Un leavening. Unleavened brownies go down pretty good. They do? Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> We're giving people ideas. Well, Kenny, Unleavened brownies. I hope they, some people pick up this message. My son has a birthday that sometimes falls during unleavened bread, and he has to deal with unleavened cakes, which is, ends up being a brownie. Which mean ends up being a very rich, heavy duty cake, <laughs> but it's good. Just for the argument, somebody years ago said, "Well, if you have a you know one of those egg beaters and you whip up a lot of air into bread or cake, aren't you doing the same thing?" And my belief is, no, you're making something delicious for me to eat. <laughs> uh, so there are all kind of ways you can. Make them good without real leavening in there. People think that putting sin out of your life takes all the fun out. And that's why they think that eating unleavened bread should be horrible for you. But unleavened bread can be just as tasty and things that you make mm -hmm. without the sin in it is just as much fun. I think that's the lesson. That, yeah. That's the lesson. You don't need the sin. You can have a very enjoyable life without it. Yeah, like Ken pointed out, you can put pounds on the exact Bring same way. I put pounds on yeah. you. But a... Yeah, I learned, I learned to look forward to unleavened bread because of the things we can put with it and on it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that there is egg and onion matzos that's better but we find it's, you know, the stores used to have more and more. But as time goes on and the world gets less and less religious, we have fewer and fewer unleavened bread options that I can purchase. And I assume that's true in other places in the country, too. Years ago, you could get egg and onion and some of the best of now. It's hard to get that stuff. And so we just, I'm lucky we still got one store we can get the basics. And it's probably going to be that way for a while, I imagine. Um, someday the whole world will symbolically eat, I mean, eat unleavened bread and symbolically worshiping Christ and the great white judgment. It will come. We're just pioneering the way right now. Um, and you know, he, you, he mentioned the, that leavening puffed up vanity, wickedness, and unleavened bread represents goodness, sincerity, and truth. So you're like eating goodness. Um, also, I'm going to go to the topic of self-evaluation. Christ said that, well, and Paul really put the emphasis on it. I'll give Paul the credit. I'm sure Christ's spirit inspired it, but we should examine ourselves before the new covenant Passover. Apparently, the Corinthian church was so out of control, there were people, according to the commentaries, had to be carried out drunk. And, and other bad behavior in the Passover service. Paul said, that's why you're all in so much trouble. And um, in a way, it's a good thing that church was so bad. Think of what we would not know if it weren't for First and Second Corinthians. So um, we might go to First Corinthians 11, 28, please, Ken. First Corinthians? Yeah, the one that's on your... There. Yeah. All right. Uh, but let a man examine himself, and let no, and, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if, I, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Here's a thought. The guy that had to be carried out drunk on the Passover. You think he's one of the ones that maybe passed away prematurely? Probably. I'm not saying we know that, but did not get that implication? Or the ones that were sick and never could get any healing? 
or the ones that were misbehaved. God was not happy if you don't respect the sacrifice of his son. So the so what the church has recommended for years is that you have some alone time to think about. Well, that's the question. What do you think about? I think I, I, I put it down. I should have done better this year than I did the previous year. And you should, I realize that's not human life. You go up, down, up, down. But you, you want a mostly upward trajectory. You know, up and up and up, 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 up. I'm looking at the screen trying to make it where you can see it on the camera. But that's what you really want. So when you don't see that, or however you evaluate yourself, you realize how much you need the blood of Christ. What do you think, Ken? Now that you've been in the church for like, let's see, is that 20 years 20 now? Years, You're no. a 20-year man. 20 years. So that's, that self-examination is still very useful. Every year you, you hope you've done a little better than last year. You hope you've done a lot better, but I'll take a little better at this point. Um, the, if you look at the, the apostles, they were a certain, they got to a certain place in, in their own times. And uh, you, some of the, uh, the uh, prophets, they got to a certain place. I'm not there yet, but we should be working towards there at all mm -hmm. times. Yeah, so very true. When things don't go right here, I'm really not there. It's ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris, you probably had you've been in the church less than twenty years, right? Less than twenty, yeah. So, as a newcomer, what are your thoughts? It's it's to me, it's it's vitally important to self-examine yourself. It it if you look at yourself, it keeps you in check. You know, it, it would be easy. If you don't look at yourself, to, like Christ said, with the the beam sticking out of the you know your own eye, for instance, you know it'd be easy to look and see something in everyone else and ignore yourself, and then you fall into Satan's trap. When you examine yourself and you realize that, as he says in Isaiah, our righteousness is really filthy rags, you know, and we realize that our we was called out of this world, and you know it, it's something to appreciate. You know, it was a gift to us, and and it can keep us from becoming a self righteous jerk, for lack of a better term. You know, keep us more of a humble person where we should be. And that analogy of flatten bread and stay humble. <laughs> they kind of fit, don't they? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Stay humble because it's so easy. Well, I know something the world doesn't know. They get all puffed up, yeah. right? And the ego. Uh, I think Kelly mentioned in this sermon about ego. I forgot exactly how he put it, but you can see the ego and I forgot. But you know what I'm saying. If you start thinking, well, I'm more religious and so and so, and you see, I think the thing of knowing something others don't know or being right on a religious thing that others aren't right on is the ego issue and the self righteous issue. It's like Satan says, well, if I get you in the, the decadent trap, that's wonderful. But if I have to get you in the religious self-righteous trap, I'll I'll settle for that also. Which whichever one fits. And um but we're I think we know some of Satan's devices. Would you agree? We're, we're getting a little smarter. And uh, there's a guy, I won't mention his name because it'll probably get us in trouble, but he's on there waving his finger, demanding more money of his people. Dan, he's an apostle and sent outrageous things. And uh, I'm thinking, wow. Uh, the ego is it's like, whoa, I'd be scared. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure, I'm not, I'm not saying God's going to strike you with lightning, but you almost worry about when somebody gets that much ego, right? And, um, well, anyway. That's, I think, one of the things we have to worry about, as well as decadence. The decadence, of course, is, the pro is a problem as well. Satan will love to get you into decadence. And... 
I don't want to mention any one particular sin. One day I emphasized one sin in a sermon. A guy came up later and said, you don't really understand what it's like to be an alcoholic. And he said, you don't understand. And uh, well, I guess he was right. It's hard to understand problems that other people have. So you got to be careful. You don't start. What word am I looking for, Ken? Sympathetic? Yeah. Empathetic? You, you don't have the real empathy for them that you yeah. should have because you don't understand Any it. Any addiction is different. Yeah. I mean. Any of them. Yeah. Like yeah. Cookies. Anything. Yeah. Let me think. Yeah. So, um, I, I, so all I'm saying is self-evaluation is difficult. It's easy to look at other people's problems. When you're dealing with a problem, too, if you've been struggling with something, for instance, you know, whatever it may be, when you examine yourself, too, it could encourage you. You could look at it and say, I didn't fail near as many times this year as I did last year. I'm getting, you know, I'm starting to win. You know, that would be another benefit. I would think of self-evaluation. Yeah, or I'm doing it less. Yeah. And just seeing yourself more accurately is a victory. Like if you're a doctor, part of the battle is diagnosing the patient, right? Because, you know, it's tricky stuff, you know, nuance. It may look like this disease, but it's really more that, you know. If you figure out the real deep cause of the problem, you're halfway to winning, right? So if you can see, maybe each year we can see, you know, how the bad gym, a little more accurately, the better, right? At least that's a good part of the battle, just seeing yourself clearly. And I believe there are people in the world that whatever they do, it's right. I mean, they, they make it right because they do it, right? They say it. And they're so far from accurately seeing themselves as, as you can get. And then there's the other extreme, people who are always beating up on themselves. And I think that's not accurate either. They don't see their human value, human worth, whatever. Even if you're, and I mean this respectfully, even if you're just a general worker, you have no particular talent, for plumbing, electrician, carpentry, all those other talents people have, engineering. Hey, the world needs general workers. There's nothing bad about that, right? I mean, even if you're not gifted at anything, that's not bad. You're still a, a person who can, you know, does that make sense? Everybody is valuable. The world needs general workers. They need, I mean, whatever they, you know what I'm saying. Um, you don't have to have high aptitude in anything, music, dancing, and you're still a valuable human being. Right? And I think some people, they say that something about the internet that makes young people more self-loathing or something. I I hear these Social stories. Social media has a, that effect on people. And they want it. They want people to. I sometimes think that there is a push to have that. Uh, people loathe themselves and have low self-esteem so the government can take the place of God and the government can take yeah. the place of mother and father and all that and, and, and be seen as their, their savior instead of actual God. Um, yeah, it's um, did we read first Corinthians 11 28? Yes, we did. Okay, I wanted to be sure we read it. Okay, okay, now we've come to the idea of in that final new covenant, um, Passover, Christ creates a blood brotherhood between him and his disciples, but we're part of that too. Can you read uh, Matthew 26, please? But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Can you imagine what a warm hearted toast that was? We all toasted the big glass of wine and it wasn't grape juice either. 
yeah. wine and like Christ says he knows he's going to die soon so that, and he's told them that and they're sad he says even though I'm going to die I'm going to be back but I'm not going to have another toast of wine until we're back together in the kingdom of God who knew that would be 2,000 years away wow that must have been quite a moment, that final toast. And then and then then there's the song that went with it, Matthew 26, 30. Um, and I've heard some people debate it was song, but you know, David's psalms were music and poetry. And even though we don't have the original language with this meter and we don't have the uh original music it's still beautiful you know the 23rd psalms you know what i mean well they a lot of these jewish experts say it was psalms i think 113 to 118 so it was a long song and a lot of jewish people knew it but whatever it was can you imagine them probably standing arm to arm singing that song and how much brotherhood they felt That was quite a moment. Um, and uh, most of us never had that kind of comradeship. Like, I've seen pictures of people on an aircraft carrier having a toast before they go out to fly, especially in the Battle of Britain, because I believe those guys knew that one in four would not come back alive every time they went up, at least during the heart of the battle. And But they were kind of celebrating their brother with each other though they were going off to die that's that's the kind of brotherhood that christ had with his disciples that that night um and what we think is that we when we do the new covenant passover we celebrate some of that comradeship I mean, it's not going to be the same as being John, who was right on Christ's bosom, and, and Peter probably at his right hand. But still, we celebrate some of that, and, and that is a wonderful thing. What did you all think the first one or two times you went through the New Covenant Passover? It was a bit jarring for me. I mean, I didn't expect what I experienced. Uh, all that I mean it was just it was and it was very solemn and it was scary I mean, it's, it pretty much scared me what I was I knew what I was getting into and I knew that it was you know I didn't deserve to be here and that's what was kind of scary about the whole thing to me the foot washing part wasn't as bad as I would have thought it would have been but uh, the actual taking of the bread and the wine and what I was actually doing and I was all in at that point. There's no turning back after that. No. And it can be a little, when you first get into it, it's different than the, what you're used to in the world. Yeah. So world stuff is flippant. Yes. More or less. What did you think, Chris? Well, to go along with like his last line, you know what it meant. It's kind of what I said earlier. When you don't do it at the proper time and you do it either every week multiple times a year and all of this it loses its meaning mm -hmm. and when you come in on that night especially when you're brand new mm -hmm. you know um, the reality of it really hits that you're there on the exact same time that they were when you think about it you know mm -hmm. yeah. and um, that's always hit me right there knowing that that you're doing it on the right time, you know, according to the Bible. I've always yeah. been the kind of the class clown where I, you know, not that you could tell. But, and that, that, those moments, that, that moment in itself is very, there is no, uh, there's no messing around at that. I mean, no. it's just, it's very solemn and it's very, I don't know, it just takes all your focus at, at, as far as what you're there for. And, uh, very sobering. It, same here. It's yeah. you're very serious on that yeah. night. Yeah. And it's beautiful in its own way, too, isn't it? Yes. And it's Absolutely. beautiful. I mean, I call it rich and beautiful, but I think your response was a good response. Because you feel unworthy, mm. but isn't that a good response? Yes. Yes, I think so. 
and the, and the, just the fact that you're also doing this with other people that will be spirit brethren in God's kingdom and what you've got to look forward to do, you know, makes all this, you know, we had that panel an hour, a couple hours ago, and all the that's associated with what's coming, it kind of washes that to the back of your mind as far as, look, this is what I got to look forward to. Mm -hmm. You think about what you got to look forward to, whatever we got to go to get there, like it says, we have no idea what is waiting for us. Yeah. And no matter what you got to go to do to get there, it's nothing compared to what's, yeah. what he's got for us. You you want to be there when he does raise the glass again, mm -hmm. you know, and, and partake of that. You know, we think he, like he said here, he hasn't, not a drop will touch his tongue until he has it with all of us. And that's right. We'll, we may be in an extended big dining hall way in the back, but we'll. Hopefully oh, toast sure. with Peter and John yeah. and Christ and you know however they work that out. But um you remember when Paul said that uh, the glory that we will experience is not worthy yeah. to be compared to the sufferings yeah. of this world. Yeah. And Paul really suffered. Yeah. And I think and I know it's hard Paul actually went to heaven in vision at least, so he knows what what of he speaks so whatever you have to go through now keep keeping the passover even if you're having trouble and you're falling down i just say never give up never ever christ's grace is big enough to, to get us through keep trying keep trying when times get tough it's not a time to give up it's a time to double down just keep going I like to quote Rocky Balboa when he was talking to his son. It doesn't matter how many times, you know, you get knocked down, get up, keep getting up, you know. You know, that courage, um, that's the thing. And uh, I actually think most of us probably think, I don't know what I would do if someone said, um, you give up this church or else, and they put some real stern, bad things, lose your job, lose your bank account. That's possible. I'm not saying it'll happen, but it's not out of the question that they couldn't do it or whatever else. And um, you think, oh, I don't know if I can handle it. But I believe God's spirit will give you the courage and tell you what to say if that ever happens. Hopefully it won't happen. We'll be in a place of safety. But even if it does, God will get us through. Right? Mm -hmm. We said this in the discussion. I actually think the American government with freedom of religion, we're much safer than the people in Europe to religious persecution. I hope I'm not wrong Definitely. about that. Well, we are for the moment, for especially the moment. Canada. Yeah. You know what they're doing to them up? Canada, it's unbelievable. I've heard stories like you couldn't believe what they're doing. They're freezing bank accounts. If you preach certain things or in certain support certain things, it's, it's, eventually what we teach will become will be scrutinized globally. Eventually, we know that. Yeah, I, I'm not worried so much about the American government, although they may screw things up. I'm more worried about what may happen in Europe. Down the road, I don't think anything's going to happen this year or next year. Sure. But somewhere down the road, someday, we we were speculating that the devil, God, of course, going to allow it, is going to pick two really evil men and allow them to quickly ascend to power, like Mussolini and Hitler. You know, you know what I'm saying? That kind of person. And um, but the world won't know they're evil. That's the even scarier part. They'll think they're saving us from the evil. Yeah. Yeah. So, but we're going to be strong because the Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread will help build our strength every year. And uh, and I hope we do I hope we do, do better. Um and we get more of that brotherly comradeship. The last thing I want to talk about is. Kelly mentioned this also, 
I can mention him. So see, he's not here. He mentioned this also that every Passover season, it seems like people pop out of the woodwork saying, you're wrong, Turkey. Yeah. We want a whole new kind of Passover. One guy wrote a whole book about it. you should keep it at home and not as groups. And I don't go into all the crazy stuff he said. And he even said in his book, because I circled in in pencil because some of our people are falling for it. He said parts of the Bible are wrong because, oh, Ezra meant well, but he was intimate. If somebody tells you parts of the Bible are wrong, run. Yeah. But they will come up with all kind of Passover ideas. And um, I want to just go through the timeline. We're going to go through every little bit of it. We've actually done it a few years ago. I even had a little chart that I believe is still available in some of our past programs, like in 2020 and 2021, you know, the three-day chart. But I want to just go through it verbally so that you can feel comfortable that we have a pretty, I'm not saying we could learn a little more, of course you can, but we got a pretty good understanding of the new covenant Passover. Um, first of all, on the 14th of Nisan, uh, that's when the Jews were supposed to kill the lamb, and the evening sacrifice was three to four. That's the evening sacrifice. It might take a little longer, but, uh, and by the way, they have a lot of lambs in Jerusalem then. It was like 70 lines of priests, but they had an official one. Simultaneously to killing the official lamb outside the city gates at the exact same time, when you read the gospel, Christ was dying at that exact same time they put the spear in him. That is not a coincidence. God does not have coincidences. He was the lamb of God. He died when the lamb of Israel died. Um, and um, and what the Jews would do, they'd kill the lamb in the evening. So maybe it would be at least by four they'd have it sacrificed. Then they would have to do all that stuff you do with, with dead animals. you got to gut it, dress it, skin it, and roast it. Um, well, that takes a few hours. And the sunset in the Middle East is roughly 6 p.m. So they'll have it done or shortly thereafter, 6 p.m. So when they eat it, it's the 15th because they start at night. So it's the 15th. So the Jews eat their Passover on the first night of unleavened bread, the 15th. So the question people say, well, how come Christ didn't do that? And let me um let me just uh let's let's read Exodus 20, 12, 6, and 8 first. And then we'll talk about why Christ did something different. And you shall keep it upon, uh, keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts of the upper door post of the houses in which they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh at, in the night, roasted with fire and unleavened bread. They shall eat it with bitter herbs. Now bear in mind, if you saw the Ten Commandments movie, they did a pretty good job of this. When it says evening. In English, it means late afternoon. And when you check all the way the word is used, you see the shadows are growing long. That means late afternoon. That's what it means. Night means night. So in the late afternoon, they they roast the lamb. And that night, they ate it, which would be the 15th. So the question is, why did Christ do something differently? Um, well, let's go to the next one, Exodus 12, 11. Um, I'm building my way up to answer the question, why did Christ do something differently? And you shall eat of it this way, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. So they ate in a hurry, so they actually started the process of marshalling up and leaving Egypt the night of the 15th. So unleavened bread metaphorically represents leaving the land of sin. Egypt was a land of sin. And they spent seven days and on the last day of unleavened bread they crossed the Red Sea and left the land of sin. It, it all kind of makes sense when you follow it through. Um, and then we can go to um, John 19, 31. 
these are good scriptures to know um, in case people try to make a big issue and all this stuff. Then the Jews begged Pilate that their legs might be broken and they and that they might be taken away so the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. High day means special holy day, means the first day of unleavened bread. From the Jews' point of view, you got these three um, criminals, whatever, and they're bleeding, and you know, it's a um, you got to admit, this is a bloody process, being on a stake and all that blood and gore. And they said, we want to get this cleaned up and all this mess and removed before sunset, before our holy day of unleavened bread. So they did it. And it's right before the days of unleavened bread. And they got Christ off. And why Christ was buried where he was buried, because they had to get him in the grave before sunset. The Jews did not want all this mess on a holy day. So that means Christ had to be buried. We could speculate an hour, half hour, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, or maybe even the twilight between Sabbath and the first day of unleavened bread. But he had to be buried just a little bit before we entered the uh, first day of unleavened bread. Therefore, if he spends 72 hours, he has to be resurrected at the, I'll put it like say this accurately. It would be right at the end of the Sabbath, going into the night portion, which would be Sunday night. But he had to be resurrected before Sunday, because Sunday starts at sunset in the Jewish calendar. That means there could be no sunrise. Christ did not rise at sunrise. He had already been risen. Um, so that that is a factor in it. Okay, um, now we come to the question of why did Christ uh, need to be off the stake early? The, main, the, the number one reason is he was the Passover, so he would be in the ground. He couldn't keep the Jewish Passover because he would be gone. But I think he also was creating something additional, that comradeship of him and his disciples. So when we go to the first pass, the New Covenant Passover, we're not just celebrating his death. We're celebrating, actually, in a way, the more significant thing is he was betrayed, beaten, humiliated, flogged, and then crucified. We're celebrating the whole last, more or less, 20 hours of his life. Because in some ways, much of that, well, if you saw the movement of Passion of Christ, you know what I mean. Some of that is worth it's, it's not just how you die, it's how they drag it out. That's what we're celebrating, the tremendous thing Christ went through for us. Um, any final thoughts, uh, Ken? I think we pretty much covered it. This is kind of like a program that's not so much a fun discussion. No. But it is something people need to know because there are going to be people telling you, you don't need to keep the holy days. and, and uh, Or they want to change the Passover. We got the basics down. I don't see you know, how you can change it. And um, there is a scripture where Christ said, the only sign I'm giving you is the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights. You can't wedge that in any way. If he died Wednesday late, right before the Sabbath ends, you know, Thursday, Friday. That means Saturday he's going to be risen just before the Sabbath ends. There's not a lot of wiggle room, is it? Nope. nope. And there's the verse that says, don't do this. Don't have sunrise service. I forget what the verse is, but it says don't turn. They, or they turn their back to the, to the temple. Uh, and they they turned to the east and they worship. Yeah. They, they, it, it literally depicts a sunrise service yes. entering, uh, uh, worshiping Ra or whatever the sun god is. And, you know, they still buy the chocolate bunnies. And yeah. the... It was worded, let me show you a, an abomination. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, it was said, here are the people with their backs to the temple praying to the east. Right. You know, and... As a, you know, like I was like Dr. Rick's grip in the Baptist faith also. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I rarely got up to go with mom and dad. I did one time. And, you know, people do it good heartingly, but unfortunately, it has its roots somewhere else other than mm-hmm. Christianity. I was even precocious enough. I don't know, maybe I was eight, nine, or ten, and we were dying eggs, Carolyn and I, anyway. And, and I said, what does all this have to do with Christ rising? Nobody had an answer. We just did it. And I, by the way, I love, at least I did at the time, marshmallow chocolate-coated eggs. <laughs> but um, nobody had an answer, and I just forgot about it until many years later. Nobody knows. I Actually, I think there are some people that know now, because every now and then newspapers will say, it's man's pagan past, but now paganism is not bad. Has anybody noticed that you'll see articles in the newspaper where, well, that's just man's tradition. It's wonderful. Paganism is not necessarily looked down on. It's worse than that. They have Satan clubs at high in schools now. Satan clubs. You got to let them have it because, you know, it's freedom of religion. And that's what they say. But uh, it's, it's country sliding so fast. It's accelerated. It's like it's falling off a cliff of, you know. Yes, it is. Well, um, we probably don't have a lot more to say about Passover days on Eleven Bread. We did mention in prophetic discussion, we might just throw this out there before we leave the air, and that is that earthquake on the East Coast of New Jersey, it may mean absolutely nothing, but it could be some new fault lines are going to be shaken up. Oh, God, we'll let it get shaken up. So we will start having more earthquakes in more places. And we're already having more wars. Like there's like a million soldiers more or less fighting in Ukraine now and and war in the Middle East. There's some minor wars, I think, in Africa and a few other places. But there's a lot of talk about war. Taiwan, you know, what they may open up the Korean front if we get involved. I mean, that's the threat. Can you see wars? rumors of war, and earthquakes, if this becomes... See, the West Coast is part of that ring of fire. They get earthquakes all the time. But now if it moves to the rest of America or maybe the Eastern Coast, we could see more. Or not. Uh, but if it does happen, we're closer to the end times. Wars and earthquakes increasing. And religious deception, too. There's so much misinformation out there. It's, and do, do people really care about the truth anymore? Mm-mm. You know, they all have their own truth now. Their own truth. That's so true. Well, there's a scripture in Isaiah that, that goes with that. It, I can't remember exactly where it's at, but it says... Let us eat our own bread and have our own clothing, I think. But let us only have your name. Mm -hmm. In other words, let us do everything our way, but put your name on it. And we're seeing that. Well, there's there's a reason. There's hundreds of denominations, if not thousands, all teaching something different. Because even in Scripture in Isaiah, it goes, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. And the implication of that is we know we're not going to repent. Bad things are outside the gate. We know we're not going to repent. We don't care. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. It's almost like we resigned ourselves to evil and destruction. Sounds like a quote out of the 60s hippie movement, you know? (laughs) Can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with type attitude. So whatever. When you heard the song, Teach Your Parents Well, you had to know things weren't going well. It was gonna end. It was gonna end bad. Yeah. I remember um, this Cookville meeting is really nice. Maybe a few more of you can make it next year. I'm sure there'll be information about it coming next spring. And uh, I want to thank everybody who held on to watch the program. I I think this inf- as I say this may not be such an exciting program, but I think this is the kind of information that we need to hear. Every year. Oh, we had a lot of people stick 
around. Uh, we were we started like 10, 12 minutes late, but and I was getting mm-hmm. messages, hey, you're late. Yeah, I, I kind of got to <laughs> working on it. <laughs> but and I understand them doing that. Um, you never know, something could be wrong at and I don't see it at my end, but uh, but we had just over sixty some uh, viewers concurrent peak, and then we've had over a hundred people come in and out. So that's just on YouTube. That doesn't count the other four locations we stream to now. Because we stream directly to the church Facebook page, line upon line Facebook page. We stream to Rumble if you want to watch it there, and we stream to X now. So. Wherever you want to consume this, you can. So, and if that's it, I'm gonna say good night and hope the intro plays. So, <laughs> uh, good night, everyone, and we'll see you back here again next Friday when everything at home works just like it's supposed to. So, good night, everybody. Good. Okay. We're happy you could make it. So glad you are here and hope that we've been able to make God's word more clear. Until next time, may God be with you in everything you try. But for now, till next week, we have to say goodbye.